today I want to give you an idea kind of uh, where I've been in my, my teaching journey, I guess, um, and, and what, what motivated me to change, and then talk specifically about how I made changes. Um, I, I don't think anything that uh, I'm going to say today is, is, is novel in any sense. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll give you an idea of kind of the, the deliberate nature of, of how I acted and how I changed and, and why I think it's good. Um, if, you, if you want to learn a lot more about the science behind what I'm talking about, uh, I encourage you to, to pick up the book I'm going to talk about, uh, but I'm not going to go into a lot of the science behind it, rather kind of what motivated me to change and, and how I changed. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think a lot of us try to achieve uh, tenure at any school, and so uh, uh, like most of you, I tried really hard uh, for you know five or six years. I uh, got tenure and then uh, promptly left my school because that's that's usually what we do in in academia. And so uh, I decided to to go to a new school. And so these these last couple of years, I've, I've been forced to to continue to kind of reevaluate uh, what I what I've been doing. And so I just got done with my my third year review and. Uh, Got to, got to sit in front of a, a room full of, of colleagues and, and have them critique what you're doing, which is always a, a great feeling. Okay. Uh, but um, when it came to my teaching, I've, I've, I've always felt really comfortable with my teaching as far as you know, what I get feedback from my students. Um, but during, during this particular meeting, uh, this, this panel of people noted, uh, your grades are really low. And um, I said, yeah, yeah, well, OK. But that's kind of economics, right? That's, that's what happens. Um, and so they, they asked me, they said, well, what are you doing specifically in your classes to help your students learn? And so I, I think that, that particular meeting really, really changed my mind as far as thinking about exactly what I was doing and what else could I be doing. Okay. So to, to give you an idea of uh, what I was doing, up to this point, uh, my idea was, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to come to class. I'm going to try to have a conversation with you about material. I'm going to give you a lot of uh, assistance in the form of, you know, possibly preparing videos for you to watch, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to hopefully make a, a talk a little bit entertaining. Um, I'll be in my office all the time for you to come by. You know, I, I even tell my students, uh, give me a call over the weekend. I'll, I'll travel to school. I'll meet with you. Uh, I want to do everything in, in my power to help you succeed. Uh, but it was up to them, entirely up to them. So it is this idea of uh, I, either you sink or swim in my class, and uh, I guess my idea is I'm, I'm going to throw you a life preserver if, if you want. Uh, but if you're not asking for it, you know, that's, that, that, that's your, your deal. Okay. So, so when I'm looking at this, at this kind of learning process that I was, I was setting up, uh, you know, I'm kind of acknowledging it's, it, it's a gift to be able to learn. Um, you know, people have the ability uh, to learn, and, and that, 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 that process uh, becomes a skill. And I think I really focused on this last part, the idea the willingness to learn is a choice. And so I was telling my students, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's your choice what you want to do, and I'm here to help you. And so some of them uh, chose to and, and did very well. Uh, but a large portion of my students uh, chose not to and, and didn't do well, and, and that was being reflected, I think, in, in the end of, of the class with uh, the student success. Okay. All right, so uh, one of the reasons I changed my mind about my approach is this book. I, I brought it with me to, to show you how big it is, how long it's going to take you to read uh, if you choose to read it. Uh, but one, one of the things I really like about this book is, is, it, is it goes through, it, it gives you all the, the science behind uh, what you're doing uh, will work, uh, but it also provides just small adjustments that you can make. And that's, that's been one of the things that I've tried to emphasize uh, and, and try to present uh, to other people over the years is that we don't have to make drastic changes. We can make small changes and get big results. So uh, I'm going to focus on, on the following uh, seven and talk to you about uh, how I am doing them now in my class. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about reading this book, and I think you'll, you'll find if you, if you choose to read it, um, is you're probably doing a lot of this stuff already, uh, which is great. It was like patting myself on the back. It's like, yay, I'm doing this. Uh, but what I realized is that I, I wasn't intentionally doing it, and I wasn't doing all of it. Um, so 
you know, I, I, think, I think you'll be, you'll be reassured that you're doing some of the things, and, and other things you can, you can make these small choices. Okay. All right, so, so this first one, uh, retrieval. So uh, some examples that I do now that, that I wasn't doing before. Uh, when I was asking my students to recall information, I might start a class and say, you know, this is what we did last time. I, I'm sure you remember. A couple of, couple of days ago, we were covering it, and, and this is what we talked about. And now, instead of that, I'll, I'll walk in, and I might ask them to write down a piece of paper. What do you remember from last time? What stood out to you from last time? And then I'll have them talk to somebody else. Uh, you know, share what you have with the person next to you. Did you get the same thing? You know, kind of why or why not? What do you think? But I'm having them go through the process rather than just me giving them the information. And I think that's, that started the retrieval process. Uh, I've also given them many assignments throughout class that are, that are very, very short, and go through that process of, of writing it down and sharing it with somebody else, and then sharing it to, to the whole class. Uh, finally, every single day in class, they get a chance to retrieve the information that they've learned that day. So I give them just a, a very short uh, writing assignment at the end of the class that they do. Sometimes it's individually, sometimes it's in groups. And, and you might be saying, oh my gosh, this sounds like a tremendous amount of work. Uh, but one of my colleagues uh, says that you know, this, this type of question and the amount of work that you're looking to do, I, I think he referred to it as, uh, as white wine grading. So yes, you're grading it, but it's very relaxed. Uh, it's very easy to do. Uh, as Darshak mentioned, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big wine guy, so I might call it uh, a pale ale grading, right? Uh, but but very, very short, very easy. Uh, you can do it by the end of the day. And, and you're getting the feedback, too, of, of what they're getting and, and what they aren't. All right, so, so predicting. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Paul was saying yesterday that uh, people ask him questions about, you know, what do you, what do you think the stock market's going to do? He says, I have no idea. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's really a hard act of prediction. But what do we do when we make predictions? We're really thinking about a problem. And the important part is not about whether or not you're right with your prediction, but that, that, that thinking about what's coming next, I think, or, or thinking about what might happen really, really forces the students to, uh, you know, to, to apply what they're learning. Okay? So I ask my students a lot, you know, hey, here's a concept that we're covering. Uh, here's some assumptions that we've made. Well, what do you think is going to happen next after we do this? So forcing them to make that prediction or just write down what you think we're going to do next. And like I said, the important part is not about uh, whether or not you're right or wrong. Uh, my prediction history has been fantastic. Uh, for those of you who follow the NFL, uh, I, was, I was terribly convinced that uh, Ryan Leaf was going to be a much better quarterback than Peyton Manning. Okay? I was close on that one, very close. Uh, but uh, and it, I, I used all the available information. Uh, but, I, but I really thought about that all the way through, and it, and it helped me to, to, to understand that college isn't the same as the NFL. All right. Uh, so, so the process of interleaving, does, does anybody have any colleagues, uh, maybe from mathematics, that have gone to what's called a mastery-based instruction? Has anybody heard of this? Kind of? Okay. You're as loud as my students. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, the idea of the, this mastery base is that students are going to focus on, on uh, you know, a particular topic or concept, and they're going to be allowed to continue to take tests until they've mastered it whatever that level is, what you decide, uh, and then they go on. Okay? And, and I thought about this for my principal's class. I thought, this, this kind of sounds interesting. But then I thought, you know, you're really setting it up into kind of this, this blocked learning, and I, I don't think that's what we want to do in our classes. Uh, instead, I, I think we always want to draw connections to what they're learning. And so when I first introduce any type of topic, I, I try to make sure they understand where we're going with it much in the future and all the different things it applies to. And then... Uh, as, we're, as we're covering another topic, I'll go back in time, too. I'll go back to the second day in class and say, you know, remember when we talked about this? So I'm, I'm, I'm always having them go back and forth with the information to show them that it's not just, you know, today is demand and demand stands alone, uh, but instead tying it all together. All right, connecting with your students. So some of your classes might look like this. Mine don't. Mine don't at all. Uh, the, the most students I have is... Uh, is 25 students in a class, so, so huge classes, right? Uh, so so uh, how do we do this? How do we connect with our students? Well, when I first started teaching way back in the 90s, uh, it was relatively easy to connect with my students. I was close to their age. Okay? Uh, I had hair. 
okay? Uh, not so much today, and I'm, I'm very close to their parents' age uh, today. So, so this process of, of connections uh, become a little bit more difficult. Um, I, I try to gain information about my students during the, the first day of class, have them answer some questions on, on small cards, and so I can, I can try to uh, explain a particular topic and something they're interested in, because uh, chances are it's not something I'm interested in. Uh, but, but there are other things you can do as far as trying to make connections with them, particularly if you're uh, picking up uh, a lot of new um, uh, videos in class to show. Uh, Jadrian, I think you have a couple of sites, right? Where, where students can, or where you, can, you can grab clips to, to put into your classes uh, to make some connections with them. Uh, but the simple fact is most of us probably started off with this, this easy notion of connection with students. And I think you'll notice over the years it gets harder and harder and harder. Uh, one of the things that's very easy for me since my classes are at a maximum of 25 is show up a few minutes early and start talking to your students. You'll gain, you'll gain a lot of information from them, and they, they like to talk. Uh, so, so, so practice, right? Uh, yeah, and, and, and this shows you how well I connect with my students. They're probably like, who's, who's this guy, right? And I say, this is uh, Professor Iverson. Uh, and, and I wanted to show you, I have an iPhone 5, okay? That's how well I connect with my students. I'm up to date. I'm, I'm all over it. Uh, so. Prior, prior to really thinking about this and, and trying to get my students to, to practice more, I usually had some sort of setup where I had a number of different homework assignments. And so what I was finding is that most of my students were waiting until the very last moment, surprise, uh, uh, to do these types of problems. And so I thought, well, you know, how can I, how can I get them to practice more? Uh, I can introduce daily assignments uh, in the class I talked about before. Not very long, but they're, they're forced to practice right there. And I ended up eliminating my homeworks overall and instead provided them uh, for, for all my classes in you know, the last, say, like five years of, of teaching principles. I'm like, here are all my old homework assignments and here are all the answer keys. Okay. So if you want to see more examples of these types of problems, you have that ability and you have that ability to, to practice outside of the classroom, uh, but I also have them practicing inside of the classroom. So they're getting it daily rather than waiting for a while to practice that information. Uh, in addition to the past, I never really had any type of practice for a test taking scenario. Uh, now I do. I give a quiz at the very end of a class, about, about 30 minutes, at the very end of the class before I have a test. So instead of having the end of a class talking about, well, what are we going to see on the test? How do we review? My students are practicing taking the test. It's just a, a much smaller version of the test covering the same types of material. So they're getting that practice. And I, and I, try, to, um, I try to tell them this many times. And, and I think some of them get it, some of them don't. Uh, but having my, I, I also put my old tests online for them. And I tell them, I said, just, just sit down with this blank test with none of your notes and try to take the test. And I, I, I tell them it's even a great place to start to really understand what you're getting and what you're not. And then you figure out what you have to uh, practice a lot more, what you have to learn. Um, but another, another part about practice, and this one I think comes through very, very well for uh, people who have been through an athletic practice. I so, you know, do, do you practice before a game? Yes. Okay, but do you just show up for practice completely out of shape and think you're going to get a lot out of practice? No. You train a lot before you start practicing. You get in shape so that practice is actually worth something. So I say, you know, we have to do the same thing with the material. We have to sit down and read the book or at least attend class and, and go through this whole process before we practice the test scenario. And then it can pay off. All right, this is, this is one I struggle with uh, uh, quite a bit, and, and Jose talked about it, um, this concept of, of, of motivation. And, and I think it, it goes back to, to thinking about what motivated me uh, when I was a student. And I usually tell my students uh, whatever I did as a, as a student, try to do the opposite, because you're, you're probably going to be uh, much more successful. Uh, but, but motivation was an easy one for me, uh, because my, 
My parents were very nice to me when I was growing up. Uh, they told me that I could be anything I wanted to be. They said you could even go to any school you'd like to go to uh, because you're paying for it. I said, all right, awesome. Uh, they did do me a favor by not making much money, so, uh, so I got a lot of aid. Uh, but but that, that was my motivation. I mean, everything I was doing, I, I was paying for it. And so I was the one who was ultimately responsible. Um, so, you know, what motivated me? Well, well getting bad grades. I mean, I, I, I didn't want that to happen. So I was very uh, easily self-motivated. And so um, I, I think I responded well when, when teachers really scared me because uh, it motivated me to, to, to study a lot more, particularly going into the first exam. Uh, but I found my students don't, don't respond well at all when you scare them. Uh, they tend to just shut down and, and not try. Um, so I, I, think, I think motivation is, is very, very difficult. And, I, and I'm glad Jose was talking about that and kind of talking about our role in motivation. And I think one of the hardest parts about motivation is it's incredibly difficult to uh, say that one thing motivates all people because uh, it doesn't. And so trying to figure out uh, what you can do to, uh, to, to motivate people is, is a difficult process. Um, I, I guess I've become a little bit more of a, of a cheerleader. I try to uh, convince my students that they, they can succeed uh, rather than scaring them. Uh, but I'm very upfront that it, that it is hard and that they're going to have to work hard. Um, but uh, I think that the positive reinforcement as, as they move along does help does help motivate them. Uh, don't, don't just focus on marking up a paper and explaining what they got wrong. You know, tell them they got something right. Uh, you know, I, I, I write great job on a, on, on a number of different papers. Uh, or uh, you got most of this right, just a little bit. Um, so uh, keep going because uh, I've noticed with more and more of my students that the the idea that they are not going to do well just causes them to want to quit. And that's the exact opposite of what I want to see. I want to make sure they keep going. Um, so I, that, that's an ongoing uh, mission for me to, to figure out what, what I can do to motivate more. So thinking about this, this growth versus uh, fixed mindset uh, concept, I like to share my own story about it. Uh, so I, I, I went, to, uh, went to a small liberal arts college, and I thought of myself as somebody who was great at math. Right? And how did I know I was great at math? Well, I always got A's in math. I was always in the top of my class in math. I took that wonderful SAT test uh, a few people have taken and uh, did really well. And so I must be good at math. Uh, not so good at writing. Uh, how did I know that? Well, I wasn't uh, in the top of any of my classes uh, growing up with, with my writing. Uh, I also took that little SAT thing and uh, scored very, very poorly. Um, as a joke, I referred to myself as functionally illiterate. Um, but I, I was going to a, a school where they, they published the, the incoming classes' scores on the SAT. Uh, where was I in math? Well, above average. Great, I'm good at math. Uh, where was I in English or in writing? Uh, well below average. Okay, so I could have easily gone through college as just, uh, yeah, I'm not that great at it. I'm not a good writer. Okay. Uh, but, but early on, I, I recognized that, uh, and, and luckily, I had many people tell me this throughout my life, uh, you have to be able to write well to succeed. Okay. Uh, so, so what did I do? I, I sought out assistance from uh, my writing professor and spent a lot of time doing it, a lot of time practicing. And, um, you know, I'm not going to call myself a great writer today, uh, but I've improved a hell of a lot. Okay. So I, I, I try to give them that personal story of uh, don't, don't get trapped into some mindset that you're just not good at something. Okay. Uh, things may have come easy in the past, and you think you're good at that for that reason, uh, but you can struggle in the future, and, and struggling is, is, is good. It's a good process. Um, so I, I think the, the personalized story on that uh, really helps out. I had a, I had a, a young, young, all young now, uh, a student approach me and, and say, uh, I, just don't, I just don't think I'm that good in, in economics. I, I said, uh, okay. Um, you have the high score in the class right now. Absolutely true. 
I said, how, how can you say you're not good at this? And uh, she replied with, uh, it's really hard for me. I have to work really hard. I said, that's, that's great. That's good. Uh, but her, her mindset was that, that she wasn't that good because it was taking a lot of effort. And so she just wasn't good in economics. And I said, you're, you're actually doing great in, in economics. And, and um, it's okay if you have to work for it. So, um, you know, thinking about this process of, of how, how, can we, how can we help our, our students uh, learn better, you know, I, after this review, I was, and by the way, I was really bothered with this entire review process because um, I don't know about you and how you feel about uh, measurements, but being told that my grades were too low because of a measurement that said, here's how the students do in your class, and here's how they do outside of your class in the same semester. And there's a big gap there. Okay. All right. So if a student takes, you know, three easier classes in my class, then apparently I'm giving too low of grades, right? Uh, so, so I was really bothered by that, and, and I even scheduled a, a meeting with my dean, and, and he said, don't, don't focus on this too much, but rather think about the fact that we are essentially making a promise to every student that comes in, uh, that we will create an atmosphere in which they can succeed. So try to figure out how you are helping your students to succeed. And you know, up, up until that point, the best I could do is I could say, I'm always willing to help my students. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always willing to spend all the time necessary. And, and I think that the students that did seek out that help uh, found they did a lot better. But I wasn't focusing at all, really, at uh, the types of things that I could be doing in my classes that could help the learning process. And once again, I'd like to stress that, that these particular uh, thoughts that I've given you today about the different activities are not, that they don't have a huge upfront cost to them. Um, but you know, if, you're, if you're deliberate in doing them, uh, I think you can in, increase the learning atmosphere uh, uh, for your students. And if, you, if you'd like to know a lot more about the science behind it, I think uh, Bill Goff is pretty close to, to an expert that we have here uh, that can tell you a lot more. Um, but I, I highly encourage uh, reading the book and then making these, these small changes in your class.